أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to session 12th of our subject on time so continuing onwards from the previous session and i was talking about events and how events are actually what we are examining because we have something when we look at the concept of time really what we have is the perception of time we're not actually looking at time itself nor are we experiencing time itself what we are experiencing are events that are occurring in time and we sort of develop a measure of that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the quran he says waj'alna al-layla wan nahara ayatain and we have placed the night and the day as two signs and so we're using these signs as a measure of time because you can take any marker and apply that and when you see a recurrence of that marker taking place after a duration it takes place again after another duration it takes place again and you sort of establish okay there's a pattern taking place here and you say okay this marker to this marker is one count and then this marker to this marker is another count and so you start establishing this count of these events taking place recurring over and over again but he has given us two signs particular that are to be attributed towards the measure of time and so he says famahuna ayat al-layl waj'alna ayat an-nahar mubsiratan so he has he has obscured the sign of night and has made the sign of day visible so there is one marker between these two signs one of these is to be used as a marker because it is visible you can see it and you can quantify it whereas the other sign is its void or its or, or or its empty space so you've got a cycle that is taking place in which there is one event occurring and then the cycle continues where there is no event taking place until the next point in that cycle whereby the same event takes place again so you use that as a sort of a marker and then he says litabtaghu fadlan min rabbikum wa litalamu adad as-sinina wal hisab so that you can then seek the the bounty of your lord and then he says and so you can know adad the sinin the count of years or the number of years wal hisab and wal hisab here the literal translation can be the count and some have said it is the count of time but more towards the the deeper meaning of that is mathematics itself hisab counting itself mathematics is developed through time time is what allows the measure of counting of quantitativeness because you count the number of events you count the objects that are in front of you the objects themselves being placed in front of you are events that have taken place in time because you can take that object and remove it from your perspective the removal of that object is itself an event that has taken place and the arrival of that object in your perception is the, is an event that has taken place so mathematics itself is derived from the understanding of time or the count of it based on the markers that we have been provided which is the marker of day and the marker of night the marker of day in this case is the sun itself and the motion of the sun the marker of night is visible on sun on some days and is not visible on certain days but the marker of day is always visible every single day and then he says allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa kullu shay'in fassalnahu tafsila and we have explained everything each thing in incredible detail in in so there is a precision to this understanding there's a, you can really go down to the precise calculation of it and so consider then as an example a point origin that begins a cyclical path and by the way you need to understand here also that time or the perception of time seems to be linear when we look at things occurring in a timeline we see it as a perception our perception is what makes us think that it is linear but in fact it is not it is cyclical events are occurring in cycles and this is why you've got periods which are known as ayam and then you've got zaman and then you've got qarn these are all periods that are occurring in cycles so 
the pathway that is unfolded is a cyclical pathway. So consider a point origin that begins a cyclical path, like drawing a circle. This path co continues on this cycle and then reaches a midway point. So you've got a semicircle, right? And it continues, so now you have a midpoint on the journey and then continues onwards to now complete the cycle. It goes back to its earlier point, that's its marker. As far as the cycle is now concerned, the beginning point, the middle point, which is the semicircle, and then the end point, those have no relevance because you've got a complete cycle. Any point on that circle can be used as a marker. You've got a complete cycle, you can use any point as a marker. What is of relevance in this case is the point that is selected by the observer. What point do you select? You can choose the time of sunrise as a marker, or you can choose the time of noon as a marker, or you can choose the time of sunset as a marker, or you can even choose the time of mid midway through the night as a marker, if you're able to see the sun, which is an impossibility. You can choose any point you want. It's irrelevant. What's relevant is that the cycle has been complete. So that cycle, that one cycle now is a count of one. And then when that cycle happens again, it becomes a count of two, and then another cycle and a count of three and four and five, and then you keep going on and on. But then you also now seeing start seeing a different cycle taking place. That collective cycle, those minor cycles, have a different set of occurrences. And, and you, you accumulate those and you find that it is now a bigger circle that is taking place. There are multiple days that you've counted. Each of those is a point on the cycle. And you begin, let's say, in spring, on the first day of spring, and you calculate and you see there are X number of days that are taking place around in a cycle until they, you return back to the origin point. You go through another cycle like that and you see, okay, for this duration, the sun was incredibly hot or, or the days were incredibly hot. And then for this duration, they were incredibly cold, which you have winter. And then it sort of resets back to another cycle. So now you have a yearly cycle. And this is what is derived from the ayah when he says that, so that you can now have a count of the years now because you go from the years, you then calculate, you break them down into days because you're now able to count all the partitions that are taking place in each daily cycle. And then within that daily cycle, you're able to now calculate how, many, how much of a duration you can use multiple markers. For example, you take sunrise, noon, and sunset, and you calculate there and you can find, okay, there are six partitions that you can derive from that. So you've got a 12 hour cycle now. And then naturally, if that is one half, then the other half is also 12 hour cycle. So now you have 24 hours. The count itself is arbitrary. You have to remember that. The count itself is arbitrary because you can derive 24 partitions. You can also derive 36 partitions or you can derive 18 partitions. You can also derive 10 partitions. You can also derive six partitions. The number of partitions you place doesn't really matter. It is the count itself remains the way it is, meaning the duration does not change whatever number you give it. In the orbit of the earth, this point of observation, where whether it's the sun rising or at high noon or it is setting or whatever, it can even be the position of the constellations now which you can use at night. It does not matter which point marks the beginning, the middle or the end of the cycle. What matters in this case is the cycle itself. What is hence termed now as time, what we call now time because we've counted this, we've measured this duration, we've given it certain partitions and we're calling this time. That word time is applied only in speech and in thought. When in reality, it is just an arbitrary count of how often each referential point is observed. When you see the sun, you have a certain duration that you can perceive until you see the sun again. That's what it is that you're looking at. And, and you're looking at that relative to every other marker. So you're looking at the sun relative to the point of of observation which is the earth or you look at the moon relative in position of the with the sun or with position of the constellations 
or something like that. You will use any other marker that is, you can see in the cosmos as a relative position to the marker that you are identifying. The hour, the day, the month, the year, they don't have, these don't have a tangible reality. These are constructs that we have given, that we have derived ourselves to give us a certain measurement. But they themselves do not exist in reality. There's no physical object that you can call a year or physical object that you can call an hour. They are just relations of one celestial body to another. The periods and durations, they don't have any existence insofar as we're concerned other than a conceptual existence of them in thought and in speech. What is really existent in this case is the orbital motion of these bodies. You're observing the motion of these bodies. Time itself in this case is conceptual and it's a verbal assignment of these motions and the intervals between them as markers. So we are identifying these events taking place and then we, we place these recurring events as markers and then the duration between these markers is what we now call time. It is the duration that is occurring between these events. And you can use any of these objects. You can use the stars, the sun, the earth, you can use the planets and people have done that. You can find different orientations going through back in history. Different peoples used different markers in the cosmos to attribute a count of time. But there is one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for us as the only correct measure of time or the correct marker to measure the duration of time. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inna iddata shuhuri inda Allah 12 shahran fi kitabillah yawma khalaqa as-samawati wal ard minha arba'atun hurum He saying that the number of months with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 12 12 months that has been inscribed in the register of Allah in his ordinance meaning this is what he has ordained when he created the heavens and the earth. Of them there are four months that are sacred. And then he says, This is the right religion. If you want to follow your religion, you want to follow the ordinance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is the right perception you need to apply. Do not wrong yourselves therein. Don't make a blunder because you can use any markers as we said. So there are people who use the, the solar count, right? The movement of the sun and they apply that. This is what's become now the standard application of the usage or the calculation of time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, no, you need to use the lunar cycle. And if you look at the lunar cycle, its initial point, the initial marker is with the sighting of the moon. And its final marker is with the sighting of the moon which means it is from dusk to dusk over a period of 29 days or 30 days depending on the variance of the sighting of the moon means that it is not a quantitative measure it is a qualitative measure it is a qualitative measure because the quantity can vary in this case if the quantity becomes relative then the quality becomes absolute and so if you look at that the daily cycle that we're using does not begin with sunrise as it is commonly perceived. This is how the modern world is functioning. It is functioning on a quantitative cycle, not a qualitative cycle. The motion of the sun is to provide you with a quantitative measure, a count, a physical material count of the motion of this reality, this physical domain, the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, this physicality, the measure of that you can use the sun and that's what he has given you in that previous ayah that we cited. He said that he has obscured the sign of night and given you the sign of day for these purposes so that you can seek out the bounty of your Lord. In other words, you work and you gain material possession and you know the count of time insofar as the number of years are concerned because you've got the yearly cycle. 
because that is an important factor when you are cultivating the land. You need to know when the seasons are going to occur. When is it winter? When is it summer? When is it the perfect time to start toiling the earth and planting the seed? When is the time for harvest? These are all material pursuits. And so for that, you need to know the solar cycle. And then you need to know the count of years so that you can know this cycle between spring, summer, autumn, and winters. You can know these cycles so that you can plan ahead in this case also. You don't want to be, you know, planting the seed in winter expecting it to sprout, you know, or, or you plant it in autumn and then come winter the plant dies out. You don't want to do that. You want to do it at the right time. And then, well, hisab and mathematics, quantitativeness. It is derived from this solar cycle, but you are not a physical entity only. You are also a spiritual entity. And for you to have only a physical orientation or a physical perception of time is detrimental to your spiritual side. And so far as your spiritual side is concerned, insofar as now your fulfillment of your deen is concerned, because you've got the fulfillment of your physical life, where you need to plant, where you need to grow food for yourself, you need to derive sustenance and livelihood for yourself. That's your physicality, your physical longevity in this world. But now you've got your spiritual cultivation as well. The real reason why you were sent here was also to cultivate your spiritual aspect. For that, there's a different count of time. And that count of time does not follow the solar cycle. It follows the lunar cycle. And the lunar cycle does not begin with sunrise. You've got now a modern perception of time whereby they, they calculate that the, a, a day begins at midnight. You know, 12 o'clock a.m. Okay, that's a new day. So the date changes now. If it was the first yesterday, today is now the second. Why? It's crossed over midnight. And then you, your, your day now begins with sunrise and your day ends with sunset. This is the physical world now. This is the duniawi aspect of it. But for the spiritual aspect, the day begins at dusk because that is when you sight the moon. And you sight the crescent moon, the new moon, you sight it at dusk when the sun is setting. And now the day begins from that point onwards. So you've got this cycle of night that takes place before the cycle of brightness. And that is the real count that you need to apply. This is now where you orient yourself to spiritual time, is what we would term it now. Instead of abusing temporality, you are now aligning yourself with the ordinance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because His ordinance takes place in these cycles. And this is what He has said. This is what fi kitab yawma khalaq as samawati wal ard. In, in the register, in the, in the ordinance of Allah, when he created the heavens and the earth. This is what he had ordained and this is essentially what we have to follow. This is part of the modern agenda is to diminish that, to bring that, to reduce that, to turn it into some sort of a mechanical count. To, to mechanize count and, in, uh, and, and likewise to mechanize perception of reality. Because if perception of reality is, be, is reduced... I mentioned this, that the, the, one of the techniques that they apply in epistemology is reductionism, to reduce everything to physicality only, to materiality only. And the same thing that they are trying to do insofar as time is concerned. So everyone is looking at their watch and assuming that that's what time is. You see, every, all perception is, is, is set on the clock. And the application of it is that that's what time is. If you want to know what time is, you have to look at your clock. There are more profound implications to that as well because the clock itself is designed to follow a language that in itself is quantitative. Language defines thoughts and then thoughts define your worldview and then your worldview enables you to perceive reality and then you cultivate your reality based on that worldview. So if the language in its input is flawed, then the worldview will be flawed. The English language is a material language. It is arbitrarily constructed. It does not have a spiritual root essence. The English language does not have a root essence in revelation. It is not a language that has been derived from revelation. It has undergone so many transformations 
Even if you trace it back to the Bible, you will trace it back through layers and layers of transformations that have reduced the language's spiritual essence and then brought it into a completely arbitrary form. So the English language itself is arbitrary. It's made up. It's made up of a collection of words that have been derived from here and there and everywhere else. If you look at the word reality in the English language, it derives its root from Latin, which means, which is reas, which means matter or property or good. And so you can see the understanding of reality in the English language is a material reality. Whereas the understanding of reality, haqiqa, in the Arabic language comparatively, comes from the word al-haq, which is one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can see there already the understanding of reality has a divine attribution, not just a material attribution. Now the clock itself that we're looking at has been designed according to that because the English language flows from left to right orientation. And the perception of time in the English language is attributed to that orientation. If I gave you a statement and I said, John gave flowers to Mary. If I give you that statement and ask you to paint a picture in your mind, 99% of people will, will form an image whereby John is standing to their left, the flowers are in the center and Mary is on the right because that's how the sentences flowed from left to right. So the movement of time is associated to a spatial dimension. It's associated with space. John has to be on the left because John gave flowers and the flowers have to be in the center to Mary and Mary has to be on the right. And that's how the sentence is structured. It's not the same in Arabic because in Arabic, the statement can be changed in multiple ways. I can say Daraba Zaidun Amran. I can say Daraba Amran Zaidun. I can say Zaidun Daraba Amran. I can change. It has got an inflection to it, and uh, it has got a, a, a synthetic ability to it. Means that it is fluid. It is not fixed. It is not static. And that's the nature of time. It is not static in the sense, or events that are occurring in time are not static. If you look at the flow of water in the river. The flow of water is not static. It doesn't have straight lines. It moves. A water droplet from this side of the bank can end up on the other side of the bank, can end up down deeper into the river or can come up on the surface. Though it's all flowing in the same direction, within that motion, it is dynamic. It is not static. And the perception of time has to be understood in that regard. If you mechanize time, then you end up mechanizing perception of reality itself. And the English language is what has mechanized time for us. Because if you look at the construct of the clock, the motion of the hands is also left to right, what's called clockwise direction. And then they say that going against that is anti-clockwise or you're going backwards, you're not progressing. If you put yourself in the center of the clock and you observe the motion of the hand as it's moving, it will be moving left to right, left to right. In clear reflection of the language itself, it has been given a spatial dimension, meaning that time has been reduced from something that in itself is qualitative, is not quantitative, it's not physical, but has been reduced to only have a physical attribute. If you look at the contrast of that, you'll find something remarkable. For instance, when you're doing tawaf around the Kaaba, you're not moving in a clockwise direction. You're moving in an anti-clockwise direction, to use their language. In reality, you're moving in the right direction. If you examine the people doing tawaf from a center point of the Kaaba, you'll find that they're moving right to left. And they're following the orientation of the language of the Quran, which is the Arabic language. You, and, and they will say that it is, or you're moving anti-clockwise. No, you're not. You're moving clockwise in that regard. If you look at the clock itself in this case, the construct of the clock is just a mechanical construct. You can take those same components and reconfigure them to, to work the other way around and it will still give you the right time. It will still give you the right marker of time because in itself, it is just an instrument. And the way you would define it is an instrument of a measurement of time. 
You've got multiple layers on that. It's not time itself. It is an instrument, first of all, of measurement. It is an instrument of measurement and that measurement of time, not time itself. We need to rework our minds in such a way to recognize this flaw and not adhere to it as though this is a blanket definition of it. And every definition that comes from the secular world of the sciences always comes and gives us this perception of time, that this is something that is quantitative. This is something that, that can be measured. And this is where their fallacy lies because one of the one of the meanings of qadr which is from its variant qaddara qaddara yuqaddiru is to measure or to have a measurement meaning you can have power over a thing if you can measure a thing and and the secular world is obsessed with measurement and this is why they're always measuring everything everything is statistic everything is quantifiable everything is right down to the precision because they believe that this gives them power but the one thing that they cannot measure is time because in order to measure a thing you need to know its finality you need to know its final point and you need to know its initial point so that you can measure the distance in between and you cannot know what the final point is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitively states none can know the hour none but he has knowledge of the hour if you don't know the final piece you don't know the initial piece you can't measure what's in between so how is it that they're presenting to you this incredible power that they're holding? What they have is an illusion of measurement. And they are giving you that same illusion in terms of how you are, your, your daily cycle is concerned. You know, you've got X number of hours that you're going to put into work and you're going to be paid for that hour. So each hour has a payment. It's been given an extrinsic value. This is the value of your time, they would say. This is the value of your, so you work for these 40 hours and then you get the weekend off. Uh, to do other things and then you work for the whole year and then you get two weeks off to go for a vacation and holiday and blow off some steam and uh, you know just waste whatever time you've been given in that interim but then you have to come back and you have to be a producing entity of society if you do not produce this is the western ideology that life itself is given a is given an attribution of production if you don't produce, if your time is not productive, you're a useless entity. You're useless to them. You have to produce, which means you have to dedicate all your time. This is part and parcel of the Dajjalic agenda. In other words, what he is trying to do is to ensure that all of your time is spent in a worldly pursuit. So you have virtually no time, zero time towards a spiritual pursuit reducing you to a husk of a human being it seals your heart because your heart is now disconnected from any spiritual pursuit and i will ask anybody out there who is listening to this to try this exercise on yourself sit down and really examine how is your time spent how many hours do you spend at work how many hours do you spend commuting to work how many hours do you spend on entertainment? How many hours do you spend on food and intake? How many hours do you spend on leisure? From your 24 cycle that you're using as a count, from that 24 cycle, quantify how many hours you're spending for each activity each day, and then examine how much time do you spend towards a spiritual activity a spiritual pursuit relative to how much time you're spending towards a worldly pursuit. A larger population, a, a much, much larger population, uh, virtually almost everyone will have to admit that 90% to at least 95% of their time is spent towards worldly activity, towards a dunyawi pursuit. And maybe 5% is dedicated to that little bit of ibadah that you can squeeze in. You know, your dhuhr prayer 15 minutes here and your asr prayer 10 minutes there and your maghrib of five minutes there. Barely anybody would be spending any time reciting the Quran and if they're able to, maybe just a little bit. Most people will just put in a Quran recitation and listen to that while they're doing other things. This is how your days are being spent. You're not spending any time insofar as your spiritual cultivation. 
you're not spending any time in the pursuit and acquisition of knowledge, true knowledge, not book knowledge only, not just the sciences, but true understanding of reality, of realizing your being, of realizing your existence. You're not spending any time in, in such kind of meditation and thought and contemplation. Though you may be reciting the Quran, you're not spending any time pondering on the words of your creator and what he is telling you and the message that he is conveying to you. You're not spending any time towards that. And you forget at the end of the day that you are but a number of days. This is who you are as a human being. Man is nothing but a number of days. Each day that passes is a day of your life gone. And you are in motion through time. And that motion cannot be stopped. It cannot be interrupted. It cannot be delayed. It cannot be elongated. It cannot be slowed down. You arrived into this world at a certain marker of time. You are given a certain duration of time and you will leave this world at a certain marker of time. What are you spending that time on? Because we say that you cannot avoid spending that time. You cannot. Every moment of your wakeful existence is time spent. That includes your, your existence in sleep as well, is time spent. What are you spending your time towards? Are you spending your time in these frivolous activities, in this worldly aspect, in the pursuit of this object and that object? You're working X number of hours so that you can get a lot of money, so that you can now you know, invest over there or get this other thing that you've been having your eye on for a while or change a little bit of comfort in your home or do this or go for a holiday or go get that new iPhone that you've been waiting on and saving up on. These are your pursuits in life and this is where the Antichrist wants to keep you because this is where you are directed away from any form of spiritual intelligence. All these people who may have got PhDs and bachelors and all these other qualifications from these material sciences that they've studied, kudos to you. Congratulations on that. We respect you for your academics. But you have not progressed beyond that. Your intelligence has not really been activated into thought because all your time is being spent towards material and quantitative pursuit. You have been kept there deliberately so that at the end of the day, when the deceiver finally makes his entrance, you will not have the spiritual insight to see him for who he really is. To see his deception is going to elude you. And this is why whenever events are taking place in the world, people are caught up in the semantics and the frivolities of these events, arguments upon arguments and debates upon debates endless debates and they never arrive at any conclusion they go round and round in circles they never come back they never come back to any true solution i will leave you with another aphorism from ibn ataillah he says la tarhal min kaunin ila kaunin fatakuna ka himar raha yasir wal ladhi irtahal ilayhi huwa al ladhi irtahala minhu walakin irtahil min al aqwani ila al mukawwin he says, don't move from a created thing to a created thing. Meaning, don't go between these semantics of causes and effects. Ibn Ajiba said, Al-haqiqatu khafiyun min absar al-mustamsikina bil asbab al -adiyya. Reality is veiled from those who cling to causal effects, causal reasons, causal asbab. To, to this causal nexus of causes and effects. Ibn Atayla saying, don't move from this object to that object, to this other object. Okay, something is happening here and something is happening there. Okay, this is the event that is happening and you're here debating this way and that way. Oh, is it Palestinian? Is it Israeli? What is the conflict? Is it a conflict? Is it like this? Is it ethnic cleansing? No, it's not ethnic. Do you condemn this or do you condemn that? No, why you? Sh why should you condemn this? Why should I condemn this? Why? You're, you're moving between these semantic fields. Remember, we spoke about subjectivity and you're stuck in this subjective plane. I say, فَتَكُونَ كَحِمَارَ رَحَى يَسِيرُ you, you, You'll be like a donkey at, at the mill, you know, the donkey. It just keeps going round and round. الَّذِي ارْتَحَلَ إِلَيْهِ هُوَ الَّذِي ارْتَحَلَ مِنْهُ He goes round and round in circles, you know, starting from one point, going round in circle, coming back to the original point. You're back, in, you're back to square one. You're just moving within this planar field. He says, 
Rather, move. If you're moving through time, your motion should be from this created aspect to the creator himself. That should be your goal. This is where you should be headed towards. In other words, when you're spending your time, spend it towards that direction. Stop spending your time towards trying to figure out the semantics and subjectivities of this planar world. Understand the event that has taken place and the significance of that event and then move on. Don't get stuck on the event itself. In other words, don't get hung up on the sign. Understand what the sign signifies and move on. Because the sign does not point to itself. It points to something else. That's what you need to figure out. That's what you need to understand and then move on to the next. And he cites the ayah from the Quran, وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ And indeed, the final destination is unto your Lord. That's the final destination. That's ultimately where you're going to go towards. And when he resurrects you and he brings you out, he's not going to ask you a question, did you figure out who the Dajjal was? Did you calculate his arrival at the right time? Did you anticipate Imam Mahdi? Did you predict correctly that on, in which year he was supposed to come? He's not going to ask you those questions. He's not going to ask you, did you figure out what the conflict between Palestine and, and Israel is? Did you figure out who is what? Did you figure out this? Is, those are not the questions that you're going to be asked. You're going to be asked questions that are related to your state of being in this world and your existence in this world. How did you spend your time? What did you spend that time on? And then he says, وَتَأَمَّلْ هَذَا الْأَمْرُ إِن كُنْتَ ذَا فَهْمٍ وَالسَّلَامُ Ponder upon these words. Understand these words. And ponder of these words, so you can you can have some you can have an understanding of reality, so you can be among those. The great Moroccan poet Muhammad ibn al Habib said, "Inna al kaunu maani qaimatun bi sur, kullu man yudriku hada kana min ahl al ibr." He said, "The world is meaning that has been erected in form. Those who understand this are from the people of discernment." from ulul albab from those who have an opening and understanding of reality this is all the time we have for today subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiyun alim wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka antat tawwabur rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin barakallahu fikum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh